We're going to start on a discussion of periodic properties. What we should be able to do at the end of the screencast is define the terms first ionization energy and electronegativity. We should also be able to describe and explain the trends in atomic radii, ionic radii, that first ionization energies, electronegativities, and melting points for the alkali metals and for the halogens. And then also describe those same trends for the elements across period three. We should also be able to compare the electronegativity values of two more elements based on their positions on the periodic table. Okay. As you may know, elements show a gradual change in certain physical properties as you go across a period or as you go down a group. And these repeat themselves after certain intervals. Okay, in other words, they're periodic, hence the periodic table. The trends that we'll be looking at, ionization energy, electronegativity, electron affinity, atomic radius, and ionic radius. All of these properties and trends are a result of something called the effective nuclear charge. And this refers to how effectively the protons do, or do not, pull on their own electrons and the electrons of neighboring atoms. So it all has to do with that electrostatic force, that electrostatic attractive force, between the protons and the electrons in the atom. Okay, now, as you go across the periodic table in a period, that means from left to right, you increase both of the protons and the electrons. Ah, but you've got to think about where are these things located? Where are those protons? Where are the electrons located? Remember, you're adding protons to the nucleus in the center. The electrons are spaced out in a huge space comparatively to where the nucleus is. Okay. Huge, hard to draw to scale because we would need a football stadium. Okay. Nucleus very, very small in the center. Electron cloud huge around that nucleus. Okay. Electrons tend to see that attractive force of the nucleus. Okay. If they're in the same energy level, i.e. the same distance, they don't really see each other, so they're not really as repelled. The electrons between the nucleus and those outer electrons do repel the outer electrons to a certain degree. Hence, we've got that shielding effect. There is a term called Z-effective. That, in effect, is equal to the number of protons minus the number of inner electrons. Okay? This again is an over, oversimplification. As the atom gets bigger, there is a uh, multiplier because there are some uh, repulsive forces involved in, as well. But you can uh, approximate what the Z effective is or how effective is that um, pull of the nucleus on the outer electrons by taking the number of protons minus the number of inner core electrons, meaning everything but the valence electrons. Okay, so let's talk about the atomic radius and what happens as I go across a group, I'm sorry, if I go down a group or across a period. As I go down a group this way, okay, 
every time I go to the next period in the periodic table, I am adding an energy level. I'm increasing that shielding effect, adding layers on an onion, so to speak. The atomic radius increases as I go down a group because the attractive force between those outer electrons and the nucleus is less. As I go across a period, okay, so going down, it increases. Going across, the radius actually decreases. My Z effective is actually getting larger. My inner core number of electrons doesn't change because I'm in the same highest energy group. My number of protons is increasing, so my Z effective or that attractive force for the electrons by the nucleus is increasing. Okay, okay and you can see the trend is for the atom to get smaller as I go across a period, particularly um, speaking third, large and small. All values are in nanometers. Nanometers, to remind you, are 10 to the negative ninth meters. Okay, So they're all roughly between, say, 0.2 and 0.1 nanometers. And this just gives you an idea using a different um, picture as to what the radii do for the first five groups. And this is just another picture of the atomic radius as you go across and as you go down a group. Um, note that there is a small exception here with the neon noble gas actually slightly larger than the fluorine when you expect it to be smaller and the same thing with helium and hydrogen. I'd like to take a minute and look at a the atomic radii. It is possible to estimate the radii of atoms in characteristic bonding situations by observing the distances between atoms in molecules. In any given group of the periodic table, for example, group 6A, the atomic radius increases as we move downward. As we move from left to right in any row, the atomic radius generally tends towards smaller values. This occurs because the effective nuclear charge acting on the outermost electrons is increasing. As we proceed across the first long row of the table in which electrons are being added to the valent shell D orbitals of the metals, we see an overall decrease in radius as a result of increasing effective nuclear charge. Now if we take a moment and look at ion trends. Hmm. So what do you say? If we look at an isoelectronic series, which we will in just a moment, It's interesting to see what's going on there. Let's talk a little bit more in detail. If an atom or an element becomes a cation, meaning a positive ion, those are going to be smaller than their parent atom because they're losing an electron. You have one less electron than you have protons, overall positive charge. The remaining electrons are going to see that increased attractiveness and pull in closer, so the attractive force increases. So when we form a cation, cations are going to be smaller than the parent atoms that they come. The electron-proton attractive 
force has increased, so the radius decreases. And you can see this trend looking at um, atoms and the ions that they form. And if we look at the ionic trend of, say, the ions in the first group, they get larger as you go down a group, again, because of the shielding effect and those inner electron energy levels shielding that outside. On the converse side, if it's a negative ion, an anion, they're going to be larger because I'm adding an electron, I'm increasing those repulsive forces, those repulsive forces will make the um, ion larger than the parent atom. Okay. So they're larger because the electron-proton attractive force has decreased, so the electrons are not held as um, tightly. The ion or the anion gets larger. And again the trends are going to be the same as you go down a group because you still have the shielding effect with the ion, anion. Now let's take a look at something that's called an isoelectronic group. Isoelectronic group. What is an isoelectronic group? Well, isoelectronic ions have the same number of electrons. So if we look at um, this group, we can see that all of these ions, if you look at the periodic table, will have 10 electrons. Right. So if we look at an isoelectronic group, you notice that the most negative ion is the largest. The most positive is the smallest. But this again is looking at ions that have the same number of electrons. Hopefully it makes sense to you that the most negative with more electrons than protons are going to have the most repulsive forces and be the largest ion as compared to the atom that has lost electrons, so it has less electrons than protons, increased attractive forces, smaller ions. Metals lose electrons more easily than nonmetals. They're larger. They're larger because the attractive force between the proton and the electron are less, so they are more likely to lose them than a atom that would be smaller, those nonmetals. They like to actually gain electrons, or actually they're more apt to attract them because the attractive force between those protons and the outer electrons is greater, making the radius smaller, the nonmetals are more likely to attract an electron to themselves. I think that's where we may end this screencast and we'll come back to ionization energy.